Hello. Thank you guys all for coming. I know we had a lot bigger RSVP than turnout, but I'm really excited that you guys are here and excited to learn about solar co-ops. Um, my name is Carolyn Ives. I'm a Selk um, co-ops intern for the summer here at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, um, which for those of you who don't know is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide education, um, advocacy, work, um, research for just and resilient local economies. Um, and I just want to mention um, that we do appreciate any donations that you guys offer just so that we can continue providing this kind of programming in the future. Um, and to thank our host, Impact Hub, for letting us use this space. Um, so our main speaker will be Dave Ron from Energy Solidarity Cooperative, um, who will be doing more in depth on his model um, as a solar co-op, and um, yeah, so we'll be getting to him shortly. And yeah, just to give a little bit of a layout for today, um, I want to go over some like expectations from you guys, like what you kind of came here to learn in terms of the solar cooperatives. Um, then I'm going to give a short presentation on CPN, Community Power Networks, um, resources, and what they offer in terms of solar co-ops, and it was very generous of them to provide all that information for me to use for um, today. And um, we'll go on to ESC and then finish. Uh, Christina will present um, the Local Economy Securities Act um, information. Um, so just like, can we go around the room, maybe like introduce yourself really briefly and then like maybe an expectation or something you want to learn from today? Let's start. Hi, my name is Amanda Poole, and I run a law school clinic in Boston, and I just happened to be in town for a meeting with oh, Selk, cool. so yeah. I didn't even know this was happening. Oh. Um, but I would say I expect from the first slide a little bit <laughs> that, I, that we get to hear some examples of ways that this is been put into practice. Cool, thank you. I'm Barbara Stebbins. I'm with the Local Clean Energy Alliance, oh. and active in the community choice program that might be formed in Alameda. I'm really here to hear about how solar cooperatives work. Okay. Partly because we believe really strongly in a community choice program that can incentivize those kinds of programs. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Cindy, I'm an intern with Selic this summer, and um, yeah, I know there's like I've been hearing about different examples of solar cooperatives around the country, but I don't know very much about how it functions or kind of I'm excited to learn more sort of the whole like what is a solar cooperative. Cool. Thanks. Hi, I'm Monica Linky, and I'm an attorney and volunteer here at Self, and I don't know anything about this topic, um, so I'm just interested to learn about it. Great. Hi, uh, I'm Adam. I, uh, I guess I spend a lot of time reading about um, <laughs> solar power, alternative energy, and futures that I might want to live in. Um, and I'm curious as to ways of uh, you know, broadening solar beyond people who are you know, homeowners or mass corporations putting solar on their tops. Yeah, great, thank you. I'm Shanna, I'm also interested in with Salk, uh, and I came because I know a lot about starting a cooperative now, like your worker cooperative, but I don't know how it's, I don't really know a lot about the different other, like the other types, so I'm interested in hearing how they're different. Cool. Uh, I'm Christina, I work for Salk on legislative advocacy, and I also think um, a lot about finance for small businesses and nonprofits, and so I'm interested in like learning more and thinking more about energy cooperatives and like where the money comes from and where it goes and how all that works. Great. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so I'm going to be introducing um, CPN's main model, which is kind of a neighborhood um, cooperative where it's used more like more like um, neighborhood neighbors getting together collectively to buy solar in bulk so you can cut down on the expenses. Um, so, to introduce Community Power Network, um, they're a network of grassroots, local, state, um, national, um, and their goal is to build and promote renewable energy projects. Um, they have four different programs statewide, um, 
well, sorry, they have four different programs each in their own states, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the D.C. area. Um, but they also provide resources nationally, um, just education, materials, resources, and connecting people that are already involved in this conversation um, to other people who are also involved um, to get the ideas like going um, in this discussion. So they're, generally they help with technical support. Um, so getting people through the process of actually starting their own group, um, getting the group together, so actually outreaching to the community and making sure that they have a big enough group, taking them through the entire process of like getting it installed and the follow-up after that. And they're also involved in like advocacy efforts in the neighborhoods, um, policy that is around renewable energy. Um, so they help uh, other organizations start uh, that process as well. And then just other resources that they provide. Um, so this is their solar neighborhood solar model also. I mean, it has a lot of different names depending on who, what site you visit. Um, also called group buying program. So in 2014, they made the strategic um, decision to focus on solar co-ops, this type of co-op, um, at the core of their, of their state work. So this is mostly what they work with. Um, the basic approach is to gather homeowners, farmers, business people together and say, let's go solar as a group and save on installation costs because the installer will save, up to, save you up to 20% when you buy in bulk like that. Um, so that's incentive, financial incentive, and it makes it more financially fe um, feasible to install solar on your own home um, with a group. And so this is kind of the process. Um, they have all this information online, and it's a great resource. Um, so basically, you attend an info session with CPN and learn more about what's going on. Try to form a group, um, your local, either it's your business or neighborhood and um, make sure all your, your roof is compatible with the installation. Um, solicit local bids, so with your team, you are reviewing and looking at different installers um, and figuring out what gives you the best deal and what you're looking for the most. And um, decide collectively, and CPN helps with this process. It's a collective decision-making process. That's kind of where the co-op model comes in um, to this neighborhood solar model. And then you um, get a contract individually with the installer. So it's actually just you and the installer making the contract. Um, and yeah, then they, CPN also helps you through the install, installation process and the follow-up. And after um, that, you have solar. Um, so that's just a little brief overview of their process. Um, this is their success from last year, 2014. Um, they implemented 15 co-ops. Um, 1,590 recruited solar, solar co-op members, 413 systems installed. So this is a um, system that's been working in this East Coast area, and that should be looked into like expanding into other areas as well because they're obviously pretty busy um, getting more solar installed. Um, so I'm going to go walk through a really quick case study um, of West, their West Virginia program. Um, and so basically they have two counties, Monroe and Fayette counties, that were interested in starting this process in West Virginia. Um, they had heard about it from the Virginia program and saw success there and wanted to expand into their states. Um, it was co-sponsored, the, these programs, the, this program was co-sponsored by the Stand Up for Monroe anti-fracking organization. It was a local, local community-based organization and they thought that, look, you know, we, you can only oppose dirty energy so much, you also need to offer an alternative. And that's where they wanted to increase the electric grid and, you know, start renewable energy sources in that state or in those counties as well. Um, so they had a core group of dedicated leaders who were interested in expanding renewable energy sources, ex interested in expanding solar, and got together and with CPN were able um, to get this program going. Um, and they were so successful, they got some more media attention. It was their successes were aired on public radio, and this was an example of the successful installations of the neighborhood uh, model that I discussed on the previous slide. So, um, as you can see, like here are the statistics from this last year: 119 co-op participants, 14 signed contracts, 
So this was a really successful installation of their model. Um, in the West Virginia program, they also introduced or started actually with something called the solar hauler model, which is what they term another um, solar co-op model in which it's more of a crowdfunding technique. It's for where it's not exactly financially viable to um, for like low income res residents and disenfranchised communities to install solar um, on their individual homes. So they come to together collectively and either through crowdfunding or in this case, um, they installed hot water tank regulators and the money they saved from this system, um, they put towards the the for the funding of these installations. Um, so that was another um, model that they used in West Virginia. However, Community Power Network decided that this was best used as a private in enterprise model. So this kind of like split off from CPN. Um, but um, looking at different models, this is another one to consider for, because not all communities can afford, not all residents can afford their individual installations. Um, yeah, so besides technical assistance and support, CPN also uh, worked on a number of advocacy um, issues in West Virginia. And one of them um, specifically that I wanted to mention was they established a registration process um, for solar homeowners wanting to sell renewable energy credits. So this process has already existed, um, only, but only for like utility um, power plants that have existed previously, and they never even considered doing this for home ownership. Um, but because more people are going solar on their homes, they thought that this was um, a necessary incentive. So they actually were successful in passing that. Um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about CPN. Um, I, they have a lot of other models on their website. And yeah, OK. So actually, I have some. Um, I can, I guess, pass these out really quickly since it's only a few again. This is just more information on like the models that we're discussing today. And then you can look up the resources. And CPN lists a lot of other models, cooperative um, solar co-op models, that are implemented in other areas. And it's just important to also like, realize that different models work be better in different places for different audiences. So these are just a few that worked for, have previously worked for CPN. Um, with that, I want to hand this over to ESC, and he has a presentation ready for us. Did anyone have any quick questions on that part, just because it's a small group? Um, there? Okay, cool. Can you plug in? Uh, thank you to Selk and the Hub for having us. Uh, I am Dave Ron. I work as a co-founder and a worker member of the Energy Solidarity Cooperative, and we're just a few streets away from here on 15th and Webster. So come visit us anytime. Um, I also have to apologize as I have to leave around 7 o'clock. I had not been intending on presenting. It would have been uh, another co-founder, Shiva Patel, today, but Shiva had some unexpected circumstances. So. So I'm also not going to focus too much on these presentation slides. I'd rather solicit questions from folks, and then we could actually get into the nitty-gritty of what people are really interested in. But one of the ones that I wanted to show was this map that we actually pulled some of this data from a really great report put together by a group called Center for Social Inclusion. Uh, they're based out east, and it's called Energy of Democracy for All. It's a report that they did last year where they tried to scan a number of the different kinds of cooperative models that exist, what communities they focus in, how they purchase their electricity, how they're financing some of these systems. So I encourage you all to look at that. I'm not sure if um, CPN has that report on their website, but um, it seems like this group, Center for Social Inclusion, is trying to fill in some of the gaps that CPN is not focusing on, particularly not just the models, but what communities they're focused in. Um, but some of the examples that they bring up are purchasing cooperatives, and we could just quickly go through what each of these means. Consumer cooperatives, rural electric reform cooperatives, housing co-ops, and worker co-ops. And these are some of the locations that you'll find on the map that they also have on their website of where they're situated, and they have case studies available. So I encourage you all to check that out. Um, also, as a side note, we sat on a panel at the Local Clean Energy Alliance Forum that happened just this past year. This, this past year or was it last year? No, this year. This uh, year. 
um, with the, the founder of CPN, and it was really um, incredible hearing about their story because this is a number of people who just as homeowners on a neighborhood block collectivized and decided we can actually finance these systems ourselves and just figured it out. You know, there weren't, weren't developers involved, there weren't people with necessarily technical backgrounds involved. They just kind of figured out all of the pieces that they needed to. I mean, that was a while ago. They had, a, they had this is one of the things that we hear from a lot of cooperatives, including Community Power Network, um, is that, you know, there's a lot of figuring out what works and what doesn't work before you settle on a model that actually makes sense in terms of both the governance structures, the ownership, how to legally navigate some of the questions around financing and lending and all of that kind of stuff. Another group, and I'm not sure if they're on your community power network handout. Is that just from the community power network, the handout, or is that? Uh, also okay. Um, that I would uh, suggest looking into is a group called Co-op Power, and they are based in Massachusetts, but similar to Community Power Network, have a number of different renewable energy co-ops with a number of different models, and they sort of see themselves as a nexus that helps facilitate or incubate all of these different co-ops. So they have biodiesel co-ops, um, solar co-ops, wind co-ops. So uh, we could just quickly go through like what each of these could look like. A purchasing cooperative, I think Carolyn touched on this, is the idea that you have a group of individuals who don't necessarily have any legal entity already in place, and they use their collective power and their collective, um, their collective funds to basically purchase components at a wholesale cost. That's most, mostly what a purchasing cooperative is. Um, so they form a legal entity, uh, they collectivize their finances into a pot and say, okay, well, we can actually have bigger systems because there's more of us who have a number of different houses that we want to install these systems on. And so it brings down the costs, and that's effectively what it is. Uh, consumer co-ops, there's at least two different ways that consumer co-ops can manifest. One is a, a traditional consumer co-ops in that it has a separate consumer co-op business, like a grocery store, and it uses that as a means to finance, uh, to, to provide seed capital to purchase some of these, some of these uh, systems and the components for the systems. The other type of consumer co-op would be something like a solar garden or a shared solar type of scenario where you have a number of individuals who are not directly at the site where the energy is being generated, but they are consuming that energy through the grid, through the electrical grid, and the utility for that service territory would credit them accordingly. So we could get a little bit into that and the state of shared solar legislation in California is such that not many of these projects are happening right now. Um, rural electric reform cooperatives are, so your traditional energy generation station in a rural setting, uh, it could be an agricultural co-op or it could actually be like a coal-fired power plant or a natural, natural gas power plant. Um, well, in this case, it would be if they decide to open up a wind farm or a solar, a solar um, farm, then the reason that's called reform co-ops is because, um, and th this group has done quite a bit of work on it, the Center for Social Inclusion, um, the idea is that some of the legislation around what rural electric co-ops are providing to their members in terms of the actual benefits, the credits, the, the incentives, is such that it, it's, it's not really, it's going most, mostly towards the utility, not towards the consumer. So um, there are groups out east that are working on reforming some of these rural electric cooperatives. Housing cooperatives, I think that's pretty self-evident. Um, and then worker cooperatives, are, well, a group like ESC. So we went through a number of different scenarios for how we could set up our cooperative model before we landed on the multi-stakeholder cooperative model, which at the core are worker cooperative members like myself, and there's uh, four other people that are part of our worker cooperative. Were there questions about any of these um, general models before we delve a little deeper? Yeah. Can you just explain purchasing cooperatives? Sure, yeah. So a purchasing cooperative would basically be if a number of individuals decide that instead of buying our own system because the costs are prohibitive for these, like if we're talking about solar, um, for the panels and the inverter and the interconnection fees and all of that, they pool their money in together, form some sort of a legal entity, and then actually apply for either the benefits together, like if there's any going to be any rebates for purchasing solar equipment, and or... Um, buy it from the product procurement source at a wholesale cost instead of for individual systems. So they, you know, individually they might only want um, a five to 10 kilowatt system for their house that they own. But collectively they say, well, we actually have a, uh, 
collective installed capacity of let's say closer to a megawatt, and we can get we can get panels um, for our arrays, we can get inverters, we can get all of these everything that we need for much cheaper because we can buy it in bulk. So that's that's usually a lot of purchasing cooperatives that I've um, come across and have spoken with. It's kind of uh, typically a one-shot deal, you know, like they do it, they, 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 they do this to ultimately save some of the, uh, the capital outlay for the system procurement and then that's it, that's the extent of their, if they have to buy an inverter at let's say year 10 or 15 when it needs to be replaced for instance and they use the cooperative as a mechanism to do that at a cheaper, cheaper rate as well. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so from there, I guess uh, I was going to talk a little bit about our model, but I maybe rather than doing that, it would be useful to just take take questions. Um, I don't know. What what would you prefer, Carolyn? I need to go a little bit into your, into okay. your model. First. Okay. Um, so this is, and some of you may have seen this, particularly the Selk folks, so I apologize for the redundancy. Um, so we focus on three areas, just to give you a high level view, and I won't stay on this too long, but uh, one of the things that we do is we actually design and engineer some of these systems. Uh, particularly, we focus on solar electric systems. Um, but the other thing that's imperative in the systems and the projects that we focus on with our partners, and our partners being mostly community-based organizations, that could be nonprofits, uh, places of worship, other cooperatives, um, multi-tenant residential buildings, is that we institute a popular education and skills training program that adapts to their existing uh, educational curriculum. And the reason that we see this as imperative for it is because we're trying to build more cooperatives. We're trying to build our cooperative, but ultimately the cooperative movement. And we see workforce development as being a key aspect of that. One of the projects that we're working in right now, which maybe I'll have time to talk about, um, would be uh, in East Oakland, it's called the East Oakland Boxing Association, and they work with a lot of youth. They have after-school programs, and they do everything from media development to uh, health and fitness training, but also to entrepreneurship training. And they're interested in having a solar system installed on their roof, but they also want the youth somehow engaged in that. And so beyond just having the youth engage in a voluntary capacity where they're getting up on the roof and installing, we're, we're part of the curriculum that we're developing with them is really about alternative business models. Um, so not just looking at sole proprietorships, but what are cooperatives? How can people actually incubate these that are not renewable energy specific? I mean, that would be great because that's our focus, but any any sort of different type of more direct democratic model for uh, worker ownership and control. So that's, that's a piece of the popular education. And then um, the financing options is another piece that we do. So we are actually an integrator of sorts where we connect these systems, these projects, with what we call non-extractive lenders, and Carolyn spoke to this, the idea of uh, not just looking at divestment from fossil fuel-based investments, but actually redirecting some of those funds towards renewable energy, and particularly community-controlled and owned renewable energy projects. So that's, that's generally what we do. Uh, one of the other things that we like to talk about quickly is this idea that we operate within these intersections of justice, ecology, and labor that are really important as part of the solidarity economy. And so within each of these intersections, it means that the way that we make decisions, and this is not about the, our decision-making uh, necessarily like the methods or models that we use for decision-making, but it's the framework that we do that within. Are in, through environmental justice, focusing on green, healthy jobs, and community capital and control. So transforming and redirecting financing away from uh, extractive lenders and the extractive economy and more towards local economies. Okay. So how do we do that? Um, well, I'll give you just a really simple So we've used this as a really simple illustration to talk about um, how it happened. And basically, there are the workers, people like myself. Uh, there are the community investors and there's consumers. So we call our site uh, the consumers of the solar electric energy and people who are basically at the site where it's being generated, the consumers. And we contribute with uh, technical skills, we do the design and engineering, the community investors, which I can talk about who some of these lenders are, if people are more interested in talking about that, um, they contribute some of the, 
the bulk of the capital required to purchase the system components. And through that, we're able to install the system at the site. Of course, there's the educational program that's happening in tandem with this. And that starts generating electricity as well as revenue. And some of that revenue that's generated through the site through energy savings goes back to us as the workers. Some of that revenue is repaid through a power purchase agreement or a lease type of scenario back to the community investors. And ideally, after the payback period, and we could talk about some of those pinch points for how long is that payback period, uh, you know, what, what is the interest rate on some of these loans that are being made by community investors, et cetera. But ideally, once that payback period is paid off, then those funds, those savings, are circulated back to the community, uh, the, the consumers themselves. And the, through the educational program and the workforce development, the consumers know how to operate their own system and ideally also join the workers um, or form their own cooperatives is what we're trying to move towards. Uh, and then we focus on the next site and the next site. And the idea is that this model just replicates itself. So you either have cons people who are consumers at one given site, like going back to this East Oakland Boxing Association example, youth who were trained there by ESC and by existing um, facilitators at the site becoming members, worker members of our cooperative or incubating their own cooperative on the site um, and then just focusing those tools and those resources and that knowledge base at the site. Um, and again, it just would replicate from there. So maybe now I could, I could just open it up for specific questions about the financing, which there's lots to talk about there, the, um, the installation process, who the consumers are, what the education program looks like. <laughs> so there's so many questions. Yes. I think it's hard to know where to start, but um, like maybe just costs. Yeah. Kind of like where, what, what are the costs for energy solidarity cooperative? Mm -hmm. What are the costs for the consumers? Like they're providing mm -hmm. some of the labor in the case that you mentioned. Yeah. Is that too? Yeah. So that's part of why. The cost of actually the installation goes down. Yeah. Because the labor, you're training the labor, you're using that labor, right? Yeah. Okay. And then the in terms of the community investors, they're keeping the cost of the loan low, the interest rate kind of low. It's relatively low. So the um, so based on you know um, the cost of capital now and the interest rates that we're seeing, even with some of these non-extractive lenders, it's usually still between. Uh, between seven and eight percent, um, and the ones that we're working with specifically, again coming back to that project of East Oakland Boxing Associate, Association, it's about it's about eight um, percent. So the idea for for just to clarify that is that they would be making eight percent on the principal that they lent to that project for whatever. So for let's say a thirty five thousand dollar project, um, we would be paying them back that thirty five thousand dollars plus eight percent per year for the duration. Of that project, how, however long it's making money. But it's only, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. But that eight percent, you don't start paying that back until there's uh, revenue being generated through the yeah, through the rent. yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. So it's it's from year one, and we don't we count like we count the installation date as year zero, mm -hmm. and then we start at year one, yeah. Um, I have a question more in the formation of other like solar cooperatives. Um, in terms, just in the Bay Area, have you guys kind of like expanded to like kind of to a group that has taken on their own cooperative and are completely like self like self sufficient without energy solidarity cooperatives that have like formed their own or anything? Okay. No, actually, a lot of a lot of the groups that we're working with are uh, well, I guess yeah, a lot of none of the groups that we're working with right now are themselves cooperatives. They're all nonprofit organizations or schools. Um, and so they don't have in place yet a governance structure. We've only been around for about two years, two and a half years. So yeah, they don't necessarily have the governance structure yet to be able to kind of take it on and then just roll with it. And realistically, and again, this comes back to the idea of trying something out and seeing how it works. And we've been taking that approach as well, recognizing that the kind of groups that we're working with, they already have their you know, core competencies and, and MO for what they do. And this is kind of like an aside and what we're, we're trying to f figure out how to help support that, like how to be, you know, um, 
a sort of a surplus or revenue revenue plus kind of model for them. Like this actually is another generated revenue stream for them. At the same time, it doesn't take away too many of their resources if they're not interested in like making it a full time type of type so of. So uh, much mission. time is like dedicated to the training of a new like worker. Um, like your workers, the worker owners, right? Yeah. Campers, to be able to get them successfully like to the place where they can start their own installations. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we don't have a metric for that yet. Like I could tell you that even the way that we're instituting some of these this uh, this curriculum is totally different depending on the site. And we try to like in terms of how we finance a system and design it and how we factor in our costs, that's come down to a standard option. Like we basically come to a an organization and say are you folks interested in offsetting 100% 100 or as close to that as you want of your electrical consumption? Because this is what the system would cost. This is how long it could take to finance that system. This is at what interest you're going to be paying it. And the, the leverage points that they have is deciding how much they want to actually have in savings versus how short they want the payback period to be, like how quickly they want that loan refinanced. So comparing that to our education and workforce development piece, we don't have a standard option for that. We actually come in with that piece and say, where are y'all at and what, what do you need in terms of your training? And the, we work at a, a place called Emiliano Zapata Street Academy on 29th, uh, 29th and Broadway. And it's this awesome school. They have a lot of great after school programs and a lot of great teachers doing awesome stuff. Um, but they wanted something that was very intensive. So we actually developed with them a whole physics curriculum. And, you know, we're, we're like doing circuitry with some of these students. And the idea of like, they're more, more interested in like, we want to develop actual kind of electricians out of this. Um, that may or may not become a cooperative, that may or may not join your cooperative. But the idea is that it's way more intensive technical training there versus something like, um, we have been working with also the Asia Pacific Environmental Network, um, it's an environmental justice group in the Bay. And some of their members are more interested in kind of high level um, training around energy concepts, some incentives that exist around energy efficiency and conservation, like really low hanging fruit type of stuff. And we're just trying to accommodate that as much as possible, recognizing that their members right now are not at the point where they want it to be uh, intensive workforce training, at least now. So does that answer? Yeah. yeah is there a minimum size to make this work? For example, if a, a cooperative housing group Mm -hmm. where everything is owned cooperatively and managed, can they get, do they need a certain size of a solar system right. to, to make the economics that you're working with work? Right. So we, we work at a, what's called the commercial low to medium scale uh, solar, which is, uh, it's going to be about five kilowatts to, you know, a, a megawatt. And... The, most of the projects that we're working on are between um, 15 and 50, basically. So to make you're the, saying 35,000, that's sort of like in the ballpark? Of yeah, the yeah. It's, uh, though actually that's not, that's not actually in the ballpark. Uh, we, have, we have a project right now that is um, closer to 100, 150,000. Yeah. But, um, but part of it, for sure, from the perspective of, um, and I don't know how much time we have to get into this, but from the perspective of having, uh, being able to mobilize tax incentives, like uh, if people are familiar with the federal uh, investment tax, yeah, the 30% one, uh, the, the developer of the project needs to have a healthy tax appetite, so something to offset their capital gains. And for that, you can't really be dealing with small projects. Um, particularly the lenders that we're working with now, they want to either see bundled projects or ones that are big enough that they actually, you know, they're, they're able to um, benefit from something like the ITC. Just, it, it, you might have touched on this before. Is the only benefit to, to, to save on current bills because this is net zero limit by the utilities of how much any one uh, utility consumer can generate, like you can't yeah. generate more than you actually use. Right. But if, if a group really wants to be helpful to, to more men, more outside the community, there's this is a desire to to replicate or, or to do mm -hmm. more than their, their maybe their own uses. Yeah. Um, is there any way of dealing with net zero or, or it just has to be a bigger scale project? Yeah, and um, 
just wondering where to go with that question because we could talk about you know remat or feed and tariff projects as that's one option where community members can actually form a cooperative to become independent power producers so they're not or but if we're talking about it seems like we've mostly been talking oh, about that okay. meter. Maybe that's the road. That yeah, that's yeah. definitely something worth yeah. worth looking into. And there, as far as we know, there's no remat or feed-in tariff cooperative projects in the state of California. And there's very few in in most of. Um, well, that's not true. No, there there are some um, on the eastern. Uh, okay. Yeah, but we've mostly been talking about net meter projects. Um, I don't know if, if I stated that as a disclaimer, but that means that for folks that don't know. The, whatever people are consuming on site, they are the primary users of that electricity that's being generated as well. And there are some, um, your, your question prompted some other uh, considerations that you know we, and, and other incentives, um, I was trying to remember. Your, your question again was around, oh yeah. So one of the things is that it's not just the savings, it's not just the uh, savings on top of what they don't consume. Um, there's ways that you can actually, well, one of the things that you can do in order to create more savings for a project is switching tier rate structures. Um, so you can actually, when you install a solar energy system, you can uh, sign up with the, with the utility, let's say PG&E, to actually be on a different rate plan so that when your system is generating the most amount of electricity, you're actually benefiting from the best rates. Um, from your original rate plan. So you're actually from a, you're, you're taking a seller's perspective rather than a buyer's perspective. That's one, one of the aspects. Another aspect is like an ITC 30% uh, tax credit. And the way that we're, um, the way that we've been modeling our projects is that we have a number of pots. So one of those pots is basically, we're not, and we're not talking about um, expenses. We're talking about actual like net profits or what we would call surplus or dividends that are taken from uh, the electric, uh, the energy savings or the revenue that's being generated through the project, one of those pots is going towards just consumer savings. So they actually put that money in their pocket. So in the case of, let's say, East Oakland Boxing Association, it means that they have about $500 in savings per month that they put in their pocket. In the case of, the, so the second pot would be uh, what we call the ESC dividends pot. That's what we would allocate to our members at the, at the end of the year, or we would um, reallocate it towards seeding new projects. So our members could defer to actually, no, let's keep that in the pot and actually use it for more projects. Similar to a, to a type of scenario, like if people are, are familiar with Revolve, which is a nonprofit, not a cooperative, but they do something similar to that. They take the revenues generated from one and help seed another project. Uh, and then the third pot is just, and this is typically what we're the most amount of, um, uh, of savings and, and revenue are going into is the refinancing pot, you know, because we basically want to, we want to chip away at that loan. But um, again, so many directions I can go on with this, but one of the things about working with the non-extractive lenders is, is that they're interested in working towards a cash purchase or leasing scenario where they're not the principal holders of the, those assets. Of, you know, and that's, that's key for making our model work. Because even if we're setting this up as a lease, it's imperative to us to have that happen in a way where the property um, the consumers at that site, whether they're tenants or property owners, are the ones that are benefiting most from the tax incentives, et cetera. And so uh, two things I could say about that is one, at the end of the financing period, the idea is that all of the tax incentives and, um, and the, the rebates and the savings are going towards, they're being redirected from necessarily the co-op or the investors towards the consumers. And the other thing I could say about that is by by having this as a cooperative, unlike other models, things like a power purchase agreement um, or a lease, if you're going to try, and, if you're trying to incentivize, if you're trying to trigger the ITC 30% federal tax credit, you actually can't do that um, as the consumer. You need to, you need to be the the developer, and so this is a way to get around that. I get, we haven't actually tested that yet, but that's what we're. <laughs> but that's 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 kind of the hope and the plan is that. Is that effectively the consumer members are members of the cooperative? They're they they have you know a vote. They have a governance stake, and so you know they're they're both they're both here, but they're also here. And the cooperative is the one that's developing the system. They're, the cooperative is the one that can actually trigger the ITC thirty percent federal tax credit. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, how how are they able to trigger it? I mean, they're technically a nonprofit. 
They are, but they're a nonprofit that would be a member to a for-profit cooperative. So you have to have a for-profit partner. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's okay. based. Is that's, that the lender or? Oh, um, so the for-profit partner would be the lender would. Would actually the, the lender, in terms of lending the, fi the financial capital required, would be a member of the cooperative, but not a non-voting member. And the consumers would also be a member, but a voting member of that cooperative. So when you say a member, um, can you give me an example? Obviously, so you're not talking about banks and traditional lenders. You're just talking about somebody who has an excess fifty thousand dollars lying around. Um, right now, yeah, we're dealing with uh, private foundations and lenders who um, uh, basically loan assemblies of people who have. Uh, this could be considered, I guess, groups uh, of individuals who have like fifty thousand dollars lying around. Yeah, non-accredited investors. Yeah, we. The idea is that we would go to groups, community banks, like, uh, and we have approached community banks and credit unions in the past. But right now, um, we're focused specifically on some of these non-extractive individual lenders um, and ones that have assembled themselves to create a bigger pot. Um, also. One of the other things that we um, we looked at at the very start of the cooperative was looking at non-accredited investors through a direct public offering uh, as an option. So similarly, uh, getting a number of small contributions made, collectivizing that into a pool, and even though these people would not necessarily have um, any ownership stake, there would potentially be enough tax appetite to trigger the ITC 30%. But I also do want to stress that our model is not reliant on the 30% ITC tax credit. Like we're not. So, so the point you're raising about like you know what, you know what if what if it's these folks and what is their role and actually are they are they the for profit that is able to trigger the ITC? We're trying this model in the hopes that that can work. Like this, the ESC as the for profit can actually be the one that triggers it. Okay. Um, but we're not we're not relying on that. Like we we've run scenarios and have been working with projects that aren't reliant upon that model. Yeah, because the ITC runs out in 2016 or it might be reduced to 10 percent. Nobody really knows what the future of it, and we don't want to. We've had a lot of discussions about like where are the funds for this being um, being drawn from, you know, and how much of a cooperative community-based model can be attached to something that may be, uh, you know, not as not as secure. Um, in your developing this model, did you kind of anticipate that the worker members or that this entire model would serve as like a surplus, like something in addition, rather than people working almost like as employees for the cooperative? Like, is this, did you have that in mind? I mean, I know it's probably different for each case, like what are they looking for, right? The, the expanded version, but like, did ESC have a vision in mind, at least in the sense of like, whether the worker members would be almost serving as like a full-time position, or like, mm. just like the time commitment in general to yeah. maintain these installations? Yeah, I can definitely, like, maybe, I don't know if this is going to answer your question directly, but it sounds like one about challenges, you know, or, or mismatches between our vision and where we're at. <laughs> I think, like, realistically, we definitely had a way more ambitious agenda than what we could actually, like, support, and that comes through the most in terms of the workforce development education stuff, because in as much as we've worked out a financial model that can pay for itself and, you know, can, can bring savings to the consumers and can also support some of the project design and installation work. We have all of this like popular education um, stuff that's happening that is really hard to support, and especially because we don't have that standard option. Like as I mentioned, we're really just trying to customize and cater it to the needs of every single different project. Um, that that's been a, a I would say a pretty big um, a pretty big mismatch of visions, um, but we're we're kind of committed to that and making that financial model work. And the other the other piece of it that I didn't really mention that we've been really involved in is uh, doing policy and advocacy work, which we see as fundamental to changing some of the political landscape to support more things like shared solar farms or virtual net metering or community control or, or uh, community choice aggregation, energy, et cetera. So our members, our worker members, are sit on a number of different uh, organizations, boards, committees, et cetera, to help support the the transition towards that kind of a future, but again, not something that we have tons of funds to focus on, and yet we see as completely imperative to the work that we're doing. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess that's time. Well, I just want to respect your time. Yeah. You thank you. This no, that's great. <laughs> um, were there any last questions? And again, I apologize for having.
um, so the consumer will see two people there. Yeah. And so the idea is to have multiple alt takers. Yes. Um, and so a virtual net metering isn't truly on board yet online. Yeah. So how does that work? Well, I, I should I should qualify that by. The two people here are in the same building, so that's a single off taker. That's a single off taker. Yeah. <laughs> single off taker. Yeah. And there, uh, you know, just maybe I'll close with this, but um, you're right that you know virtual net metering has not completely taken off yet. And we we did run into uh, one project that we were working with our uh, one of our partner organizations. It was a multi-tenant residential building here in downtown Oakland, and uh, because for 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 a number of different reasons, uh, but mostly because it's difficult to be able to uh, to allocate some of the consumer savings in a when there's a single point um, single point for the utility to connect uh, that, and also because most of these buildings, the homeowners are only looking at the sort of more straightforward net metering type of type of project where you have a system that's offsetting the consumption in collective spaces. It was really difficult for us to navigate that, but um, but the importance of virtual net metering in a scenario like that is, well, one, the majority of, of um, and also I, I guess I should say that virtual net metering is right now only available to uh, multi-tenant affordable solar housing units. So it's, it's for low-income units. Those are the ones that qualify. Not any multi-tenant uh, residential building can qualify. But I guess just coming back to this, uh, this final point that the reason it's so imperative there is because you have a lot of these multi-tenant uh, buildings that are going with net metering, not virtual net metering, and the benefits are not being passed on to the people who are the majority, you know, the, the principal uh, residential units on that property. And that's really something that needs to be shifted uh, for middle to low income families that are li living in these spaces, but something that, again, that's that's a little bit more on the, on the policy piece, but also in terms of attitudes and behaviors and what we've witnessed. Um, but yeah, we, we do mostly focus on net metered, not virtual net metered systems in answer to that question. Sorry if I wasn't succinct enough. I feel like I, I <laughs> ramble sometimes. But yeah, I appreciate your time and your questions. Thank you very much. Also, uh, here's, here's my uh, email if anyone has any questions. Um, and feel free to email me.